everyone. Thank you for joining today webinar, which is our 10th webinar for this year. I'm so excited. Today, our webinar title is From Hong Kong with Love, which we invite three successful Hong Kong entrepreneurs to share their brand story, insight, and best practice on navigating the business in the new normal. My name is Corey Lam, Board of Director of the Hong Kong Association of Northern California. Also, I will be your webinar host today. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Jack Ko Xiang from Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, Ralph Chow from Hong Kong Trade Development Council, Daniel Chen from Kunjian Sauce Factory, Queen Lai, founder of Yonic, Elvis An, Hong Kong Film Director. Here is our today agenda. We will have Jacko Zhang and Refu Chow to start the event by opening remark. At 5.15, we will have the panel discussion. Q&A session will be followed. Please use the chat room to submit the question. At 6.15, we will have Wilson Loud, our chairman, to conduct the event. So before our webinar today, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, our event partner. Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office from San Francisco, Ms. Jacko Zhang. So Hong Kong Trade Development Council, Mr. Raf Chow. Hi, Raf. Uh, China SF and Global SF, Darlene Chu's Bryant. Greater China Business Hong Kong Association of Washington, Mr. Timothy Lee. Hong Kong Association of Atlanta, Mr. Henry Yu. Hong Kong Association of Northern Texas, Mr. Daniel Chan. Hong Kong Association of Southern California, Mr. Dennis Lee. Hong Kong Business Association of Hawaii, Ms. Brianna Poon. Hong Kong Business Association of Nevada, Ms. Fionn Chow. Now I'm going to pass the floor to Jacko to share the COVID update and reopening measurement in Hong Kong. Welcome, Jacko. Thank you, everyone. Let me just share your screen. Okay. So uh, it is my honor today to be here at the webinar organized by Hong Kong ANC. And I'm very happy uh, today to share the stage with um, um, two entrepreneurs and, um, ex uh, and uh, director who uh, represent the creative industry. Also, also um, Mr. Quinn Lai is also I, probably creative industry as well, although it is also partly manufacturing. So three very different businesses, all from Hong Kong, and uh, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, the topic is the businesses in, you know, how to navigate the new normal and new normal being, of course, the current uh, social economic climate, which is heavily impacted by COVID-19. And one of um, the foremost things that governments around the world are doing is to combat COVID-19 and try to get the pandemic under control so that people and businesses can have some chance of operating continuously. So I'm here to just give a brief update to um, our audience in um, the Western part of the United States, especially here in the Bay Area, uh, as you all have very strong connection to Hong Kong, what's happening in Hong Kong in terms of COVID situation. So at present, as of today, there are 5,480 cases, 118 still hospitalized, a total of 108 deaths and four new cases today. As you can see, um, the seven day uh, period before today, an average of about 10 cases, 10 new cases per day, that is much less than what we saw at our, the peak of our second wave back in July, which saw over 100 cases per day. So we have um, more or less successfully wrestled down the number of new cases. 
And at present, um, the control measures include several aspects. First of all, the restaurants and bars, um, they are allowed to have dine-in between 5 a.m. and midnight. No more than four persons per table for restaurants, no more than two persons per table for bars. They can operate at a maximum capacity of 50%, and there is mandatory mask wearing in public space places. It is uh, worth noting that businesses, by and large, have not been required to shut down, and offices are, and schools are um, basically uh, returning to normal operation. So um, another important infection control measure is early testing. Early testing helps to identify cases and con for the um, health authorities to conduct track trace and quarantine. So for universal uh, testing in September, a total of 1.7 million specimens were tested. There are and have been free testing for symptomatic or people with high exposure risks in public clinics. There are also free testing for targeted groups based on risk assessment. So for example, taxi and bus drivers, um, catering workers, uh, workers at market stalls, et cetera. There are also now community self-paid testing centers set up by the government to provide low cost testing for private purposes. For example, someone who is not symptomatic, who uh, doesn't think he or she has anything wrong with them, but just want a test, for example, for traveling. Um, they can get tested at these centers at a low cost of at most uh, 240 Hong Kong dollars. That's about 30 US dollars. The test results within 24 hours. So with that uh, uh, situation more or less under control, the government's trying to gradually and cautiously open up the border. First, um, Hong Kong reached an agreement with Singapore to implement the travel bubble um, from November 22nd onwards. Quarantine free travel between Hong Kong and Singapore will be possible, of course, subject to um, a list of conditions. For example, only designated flights that carry the uh, approved passengers who have negative uh, tests and they have to uh, follow certain procedures. But um, provided that they follow these procedures, they will no longer need to quarantine for 14 days at their destination, either in Singapore or in Hong Kong. Uh, from November 23rd, um, Return to Hong Kong travel scheme would allow Hong Kong residents who are coming back to Hong Kong from Guangdong province or Macau to uh, enter without being subject to 14 day quarantine. Also subject to uh, a list of conditions, for example, free departure online registration. There are certain quotas for uh, the two control points, how many are allowed in uh, every day. Negative COVID test within three days prior to entry into Hong Kong, etc. So for those of you who might be thinking about going back to Hong Kong from the United States, um, there are also uh, measures that uh, you need to be aware of. So for example, um, number one, you need to have um, a test report in English or Chinese of a nucleic acid test for COVID-19. Of course, it has to be a negative test with your name, um, with a sample taken within 72 hours before departure and at a laboratory that is either ISO uh, 15189 accredited or uh, recognized by the government of the place where the labor laboratory is located. So number three, you need to have confirmation of a hotel room reservation in Hong Kong for you to quarantine in a hotel for 14 days after departure. And at the airport, when you arrive, you will also need to take another COVID test and wait for the test result before you can either leave the airport or leave the designated place 
um, that the airport asks you to be at while waiting for the result. And then you will have to quarantine for 14 days in the hotel. And quarantine at home or Airbnb or guest house is not allowed. So the, a list of hotels can be found in this website. If uh, I will share the website later, if anyone's interested, um, because not every hotel welcome guests for quarantine purposes, but there are there is a list of hotels that would welcome guests and provide uh, good services. That we I've heard good things uh, about the hotels being very nice to the quarantine guests and ordering food for them, even if they don't have the local food apps. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. So if for uh, everyone, if you want to know the Hong Kong latest situation, here are some of um, the important websites that you can find all the information I just talked about there. If you have any questions, feel free to email us. Our email is right here. So thank you very much. And I'll give the time back to um, Corey. Yep. Thank you, Jacko. Thank you so much. Now we will have Raf Chow to share the Hong Kong TDC upcoming event and trade service. Welcome, Raf. Uh, thank you, Corey. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are. Um, First of all, I think uh, some of you may be confused um, about the roles of the Hong Kong Trade and Economic Office uh, represented by uh, Jacko and also the Hong Kong Trade Development Council represented uh, by me. Uh, basically, the uh, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, they are the government representative office in overseas. And our organization is a semi-government trade promotion body for Hong Kong. So that means that the salary I received is only half of that of Jacko's. Well, um, I think during the uh, pandemic, a lot of the businesses have been affected uh, and they are encountering serious um, uh, problems uh, due to the uh, lockdown of the uh, pandemic. But the message I would like to convey to you is to uh, stay positive. I don't mean the test result of the COVID-19, uh, but just uh, to take the attitude to uh, look for good business opportunities, even though you are encountering the um, adverse conditions. As the old Chinese indicate, um, in every uh, crisis, there will be uh, opportunities. So we all uh, can see that uh, despite the uh, pandemic over the past uh, half a year or so, there are some sectors that are enjoying good businesses. Uh, first of all, the uh, online shopping business or e-commerce business. Um, as you can see, um, I think Amazon.com has been benefiting a lot uh, from the pandemic because a lot of the households uh, during the lockdown, they still need to order the food they need and also the daily necessities uh, through the online shopping. Uh, likewise, in China, um, the uh, T-Mall from uh, Alibaba, uh, they are also enjoying very good business. Same as for the Hong Kong TV Mall in Hong Kong, uh, which provides the online sales service uh, through the online platform. Um, so um, the uh, Amazon.com Jeff Bezos Obviously, you know, he's the richest man on earth. Um, and uh, he has a net worth of over 200 billion US dollars. Despite the fact that uh, his um, ex-wife had taken a big chunk of his asset, he's still uh, the richest man on earth nowadays. Another sector that has been uh, benefiting from this uh, uh, pandemic is the video conferencing app uh, like Zoom that we are using. Um, you probably know that um, the richest man in Hong Kong, Li ka -shing, he had invested in Zoom back in 2013, uh, two years after the uh, company was established. And now um, Li ka -shing is holding about 8.6% of the uh, stake in the company, which worths about 11.6 billion uh, US dollars. Um, interestingly, um, this amount is uh, constituting about uh, one third of Li ka -shing's total personal asset. So you can see that um, with some foresight, uh, you will be able to get rich. Um, another major opportunity is of course, uh, the Chinese market. Uh, although China encounters a major problem during the most uh, severe uh, uh, period of the pandemic in the first quarter, uh, the uh, GDP growth was 
negative of 6.8% at that time, but it quickly bounced back to positive in the second and third quarter. In the second quarter, the GDP growth in China was 3.2%, and in the third quarter, it jumped up to 4.9%. Um, so the tremendous uh, market in China is obviously a great opportunity for everyone from the US who wants to tap the uh, business opportunities there. Uh, particularly uh, some major US companies, they treasure the Chinese market uh, very much, such as uh, Apple, uh, Tesla, and also GM automobiles. Um, China offers them the greatest um, overseas market for all their products. Uh, in particular, um, for the uh, Chinese market, the uh, Greater Bay Area is an area that uh, you can't afford to miss. Um, I think all of you uh, who are in the Bay Area, you recognize that the uh, Silicon Valley is uh, basically the um, growth engine for the uh, Bay Area. Uh, likewise, in the Greater Bay Area, uh, we have Shenzhen, which is regarded as the um, Silicon Valley of China. And it is also serving as the growth engine for the whole region. And you can also imagine that um, in the Silicon Valley, if uh, right next to it, you have uh, New York as the financial center and also uh, Las Vegas as, as the uh, entertainment center, uh, then uh, the um, overall attractiveness of the Bay Area will be greatly enhanced. Uh, likewise, in the big, uh, greater Bay Area, um, apart from Shenzhen as the Silicon Valley for China, uh, we have Hong Kong as the financial center and a major business hub for the region. Uh, we also have um, Macau, which is the entertainment center in the region. And you may be aware that uh, the uh, turnover of the casinos in Macau had actually surpassed that of uh, Las Vegas already. Uh, apart from these major cities, uh, there are also manufacturing centers in the Greater Bay Area, such as uh, Dongguan and uh, Huizhou and so on. So the whole area itself is a, uh, is a very important economic region. In particular, the uh, population there, uh, there are more than 70 million people and uh, about uh, double the size of um, the population in California. And most of the people there are regarded as the middle class income group with good purchasing power. So the Greater Bay Area itself is a very important uh, overseas market for the US companies. The um, Hong Kong Association of uh, Northern California is uh, one of the most important uh, networking platform uh, for all of you if you are intended um, to uh, approach the uh, market in Hong Kong or the nearby uh, regions. Uh, because um, in the US, uh, we have 12 similar Hong Kong business associations with more than 3,000 members. So it is a very strong networking uh, platform for all of you. And more importantly, the Hong Kong business associations in the US, they are under a greater umbrella of the Federation of Hong Kong Business Worldwide, which covers uh, 46 Hong Kong business associations around the world in 35 countries with more than 13,000 members around the world. So by joining the Hong Kong ANC, uh, you will be able to um, get hold of all the uh, membership network under the Federation of Hong Kong Business Association worldwide. As for the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, um, we are a trade promotion body for Hong Kong. So uh, we maintain a very strong data bank um, capturing more than 130,000 Hong Kong companies. Uh, so if you are interested in making use of the Hong Kong platform, in approaching the Greater Bay Area or the uh, ASEAN market, uh, we'll be able to refer to you the most uh, useful uh, trading partners or your potential um, business um, uh, partners who can help you to uh, promote your business to the um, regional market in Asia Pacific area. And uh, the TDC also organizes a lot of international trade fairs and also uh, international conferences to promote product trade and also services trade. Uh, but of course, during the pandemic, a lot of these uh, activities have gone virtual. Uh, and for the upcoming events, uh, we have, first of all, the Belt and Road Summit, uh, which will be held on November the 30th to the December the 1st, which offers you the latest uh, update on the opportunities um, that can be uh, uh, captured by you in the Belt and Road Initiative. 
Uh, apart from that, uh, there is the Hong Kong Forum, which is an annual meeting for the Hong Kong Business Association members. And again, this will go virtual and will be held on December the 1st to the 2nd, Hong Kong time. And uh, for any members of the Hong Kong Business Association, uh, you are most welcome to attend this Hong Kong Forum. And um, uh, if you have any questions, you can also always uh, uh, send your inquiry to the Hong Kong Business Association nearby. And of course, in California, uh, we have the Hong Kong Association of Northern California and also Hong Kong Association of Southern California. So um, that concludes my uh, presentation and the remarks today. So back to you, Corey. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ra. Thank you. Thank you so much. So again, we have a Hong Kong forum is coming up. Definitely, if you're interested in that, uh, please contact the Hong Kong Association uh, close to you. Definitely, you can contact uh, Yanni or myself for more information as well, too. Now we are so excited to meet our first panelist, Daniel. So let me give uh, some information uh, about Daniel. Daniel is the fourth generation of Gunzhen Soft Factory. Before that, let's watch a soft video about Gunzhen that we prepare. So it will be around two to three minutes and uh, it will be in Cantonese. But just in case if you have any question or you don't understand, you can always use our chat room to ask any question. You can start now, Yanni. 真正的原家靈魂亦都没有这个三号干线的当时如果大花园几个钟头就变成一个很大的祠堂他们之前都没有人理的到今时今日主要有五针到今天就主要有两家人去分成两家人去做试游的过程大致上都是不是大分别今天豆腰子熟的
So I hope you know Gunjan history more by now. And I, I, I wonder how many audience have the Gunjan's famous hoisin sauce at home. For me, I'm a super fan of Gunjan. And so, hi, Daniel, how are you? Hi, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so thank you for inviting me to the panel. Yeah, great. So Daniel, so let me um, uh, talk about your background. Because uh, in the video, it's mentioned that you was actually moved to um, uh, US with your parents in late 1990s. And mm -hmm. you actually from Bay Area, you you go, you attend uh, UC Berkeley here. And after that, you um, uh, study in Harvard University in, in the East Coast. In late 2016, you decide to assist your grandfather and, and his uh, family soy sauce business. So thank you so much for joining us today. So how is the weather in Hong Kong? Um, it's morning today and um, it's a little bit cloudy today, but we are, we're doing okay here. Um, right outside is Yunlong. I, I live in Yunlong. Um, my factory is also now in Yunlong. And so um, the commute time is short. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Great. Yeah, actually, I, I, I was from Yunnan as well, too, just FYI. So, yeah. OK, so, um, you know, let's go to our topic. Um, we know that for the global pandemic has caused a huge impact on different uh, business. So mm -hmm. how does this affect Gunjan and how do you guys manage it? And how does, I know that um, in this couple of years, you kind of reform your brand identity. Can you share us with us uh, more? Okay, so uh, what happens is, I didn't really reform it. It's um, we've been doing export business um, since the 1930s. And probably when we get to the US is around the 30s or the 40s, or at least, you know, um, as documents showed, um, it's right after the war we've been shipping to the US already. So we've been long uh, trading business with the US for a very, very long time probably older than anyone in this, um, in, in, in this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, what happens in the past is that we, um, we use um, exporters and importers, you know, like there are, there are exporters located in, in Hong Kong around the Shenhuan uh, area. And then there are importers in the US in different cities in, in Atlanta, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and um, what, they, what we do is we, we, we produce our sources and then um, we will let them do the logistics. So that's what happening um, throughout the 20th century. And um, in the 21st century, in the, in the past 10 years, um, what we've been receiving more and more is that um, people like to do a more direct business. So what happens is that restaurants um, or even like uh, uh, supermarkets, they would like to, um, you know, because um, cutting costs of the logistics. So they would like to, um, you know, like uh, purchase from directly from us instead of going through two importers or even like multi layers of the, of the distributors. So what happens is we receive more and more of these um, uh, 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 customers. And we have a more direct link, and uh, you know some some of the more uh, chain restaurants in the U.S. They 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 work with one uh, or two uh, uh, distributors, and then contact us directly. And because of the food safety issues, since the early '90s, um, we've been you know like uh, updating our uh, brand identity through food safety in the in the past 20 years. So what happens is that nowadays. You have a lot of you know like food safety issues, and then also a lot of food regulation uh, food uh, regulations from the government. So what happens is um, even the FDA um, in the states they will come to our sauce factories and do audit for uh, one week, and then they will they'll come here uh, around like three to four uh, uh, every three to four, four years. And what happens is that they will evaluate everything from, from our raw materials all the way to our end products to see if it meets the safety regulations of the United States. And then um, after we, we are certified, then we can keep doing the businesses. And that's how things goes in the past 20, 30 years. 
Um, what happens in, uh, in this year is uh, very different and very you know sudden is the pandemic. So at the beginning, we were we weren't really uh, affected. Uh, I'm talking about um, this year around January, February, and March because our usually our, our products didn't get to the states. Um, we, there's a logistics delay. What happens is that um, the shipments, you know, they go into the cargo container. The um, the shipping goes to LA or New York. It takes you know like twenty to thirty days for them to get to New York, uh, the ports in New York. So what happens is in the beginning in February and March, we were quite worried that you know like our our our, our customers in the states might uh, because we, um, back then around February things were weren't that bad. So. Well, our things are still going to the States and um, we have around 50% uh, of our products going to the States. So it's, so it's, it's a huge market for us. Um, the rest you know, included Africa, um, Europe, uh, Middle East, um, New Zealand, uh, South Korea, and then also in, in the Southeast Asia, some of the countries. So 50% uh, of the business going to the States is a huge market. And we were really affected when the states um, um, started to do the lockdown around April and May. And that's when we received um, literally like zero, no order at all around that time uh, for about two months. And then because um, cities start to, you know, like people, you know, like at the end, around summertime, people start going out again, and then we uh, receive some of the orders. And things weren't getting back to um, what you know in 2019, 2018. But you know we are getting there. And I guess it's fortunate that we are a food factory, and you know like at the end of the day, everyone needs to have food. You know you cannot just survive with water and bread every single day. So you know, for us, it's a little bit fortunate because we are not a luxury brand or, you know, like not a, not, we are essential, we, we are food. So people need to, to, to dine either at home or even, you know, in a, in a restaurant setting. But uh, we can um, predict in the future, in at least for 2021 or even at the beginning of 2022, um, things will, will have a new normal, as, you know, everyone said. So how people are going to dine out will really depending on how the pandemic goes in, in, in the future months. So that's how we are, um, you know, like um, navigating through the pandemic. And locally in Hong Kong, because of, you know, uh, you know a lot of people you know, were afraid to go out in the very beginning uh, around February, and March, we decided to launch our, um, our online uh, 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 market. So we entered uh, Hong Kong TV Mall, as uh, Mr. Chow mentioned earlier, uh, we, we uh, get into the Hong Kong TV Mall market around um, April and May this year. And things are pretty good. Um, in the beginning, but uh, it's slowed down these days because uh, the past month, because uh, people start going out again in Hong Kong, people are, uh, are, are fed up already, at, uh, locking down at home, and you know, like they want to go out and have a, a, a more, you know, like dining experience. And because the, the, the apartments in Hong Kong is very small, and people don't really cook, so that's um, that's a that, that's a um, locational difference if, if it's compared to the U.S. Okay, great. And when I look at the screen right now, and I, I see that you have the showroom, showroom to showcase the history of Gunjan and also the sauce making process in Shanghuan. Can you share with us the concept and the idea behind it? Okay, so what you've seen in, uh, in the um, upper left hand corner, the second picture, it's our new showroom. It used to be a um, in the office, but um, we created this um, last year, um, and um, it's more like a, a showroom where people can go in and, and, and look at our products and purchase our products, and um, we are thinking besides our products, we will also feature other made in Hong Kong products um, in this showroom in the near future, probably in next year or the next few months, we'll uh, put in more uh, local brands, um, food products, um, 
inside. Uh, also, we're thinking about um, getting a, a small freezer so we can people can can get a locally made uh, fish balls or like meatballs, these kind of things. Great. And it's more like a, you know like to 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 um, um, to tell people uh, that we are we have been in Hong Kong for over ninety years and. And yeah, so, so that's our, our plan of doing these kind of things locally. Um, in the US, it's, it's quite different because we are located in Hong Kong. It's very hard to control what's happening in, in different cities, you know, like, let alone just the West Coast or the East Coast. So um, we'll still keep um, you know, the supermarkets and the restaurants you know, for them to, to, to do our, 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 their own marketing work for our brand. Okay, great. Thank you, Daniel. So you make me want to have uh, some Hong Kong food now. So, but it's too bad that I couldn't go back to Hong Kong. But thank you so much, Daniel. You let us to know more about Gunjan. Okay, now we're going to meet our second panelist, uh, Kareen Lai. Let's watch the video and we will know more about um, his uh, uh, company, Yannick. I founded Ionic based on one belief. When quality mechanical watches meets customization, magic happens. Part of that magic is that now watches don't only carry the values of craftsmanship or brand legacies, but they carry everyone's individual stories. All of our watches are designed for personalization. That's very different from just designing a watch, because a personalizable watch needs to look good on its own, but it also needs to be able to incorporate the customer's story without taking the spotlight away from that story. Thanks to our software team, designing your own watch has never been easier. Our watches were used as wedding gifts heirlooms, so they are actually important to a lot of people around the world. And that compelled us to go for a quality standard that is way beyond any fashion watches. It needs to be more than a seasonal fashion statement. It needs to be meaningful and timeless. So that is why when we chose our components, we focus a lot on getting the quality and durability um, to make sure that our watches can last. And with many iterations and with the help of our international partners, we are now very proud to offer watches that can easily last decades. At Yannick, we believe that stories should be told one by one. And that is why a single watchmaker will craft, assemble, test and package the same timepiece. We know that it might not be the most cost efficient, but we really believe that it's the only way to convey your story. We have shipped over a thousand watches to 30 plus countries. With the experience, prototypes for this new product, and our watchmakers ready to make your watch, we now need your help. With your help, we'll be able to start making these beautiful, unique timepieces for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yanni. Okay, Yana is one of the fast growing custom watch company in Hong Kong. So, uh, hi, Quinn, how are you? Hi, not bad, I, not I, bad. I can tell you that I did order from your 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 company in the last 30 days. So I'm one nice. of your fans. All right, um, how are you? Not bad, not bad, not bad. Great. I know you study at Stanford University before you going back to Hong Kong. So what do you miss most in San Francisco Bay Area? I miss driving. I mean, back there driving is when I, it's like when I feel pressure and I want to go relax, I go driving. In Hong Kong, after you drive, then you need to go relax somewhere. So <laughs> the other way around. Okay, good. Okay, got it. Okay, so let, let me ask you some question now. So, you know, due to the global pandemic, many business focus more on e-commerce e um, e and digital marketing. What does make Ionic stand out from the competitor? How does Ionic transition its business model? Can you share with us? That's actually quite an interesting story. I thought, um, I'll share a screen real quick to show you guys what my 
what we did last year, which actually was like in the worst timing. So we were, we were, we almost basically, I almost closed shop. I'll just tell you that we, we, we borrowed money. We wanted to go into offline experiential shopping um, before last year, mid year. So it was Q1, Q2. So, and after that, we have the, the social, rev, the, the revolution, the movement. And after that, we have COVID. So we basically had a good one year period where we took hit for anything offline. Now, <clears throat> this screen that I just shared, um, it's the workshop site of our, of our brand. So the video that you guys saw is like a really old one. When I saw that, it's like, wow, brings back time. It's like a good four years ago when I, when I did this. Um, so so I'm, I, it's no longer on Indiegogo, so guys don't go search on Indiegogo. Um, but it's, it's interesting to look at when I said those words, when I care about those things, and now it has turned into this company today. It's no longer just 30 countries. We, we ship to 100 over. Or we, we ship to places where the address is like only country and then city. So there is no street. Um, no building numbers. And the reason is because that guy owned the city. <laughs> so we ship a watch to that city and it arrives at one person's house apparently. But yeah, so we do ship to play different places. But back to the story, last year we shifted a lot of things offline. That was due to the forecast of Facebook getting more expensive, more and more people going to eSport. Um, so we thought, okay, we have to go back to the old school way, experience in an offline. Uh, where people can try out different things. So we did a lot of tech enabled um, offline experience. Like we did videos, we did QR codes and everything to link um, the experience where people can learn about watchmaking without our staffs being too trained in the, in the space. So we don't, while we can have like 20 to 30 people making watches at one go, we don't need to have like 10 plus watchmakers there guiding them on the steps. So that's kind of what we did. We spent quite a bit of money and then most of it, it's not like it's down to drain, but um, we basically couldn't sell anything. Um, creating a product without the ability to actually go to the press about it, meaning you, you're, you're kind of shooting your, it's not like shooting yourself in the foot, you, you, you're stuck. You cannot do any marketing on it. So, so we, were, we were pretty stuck last year. Um, so then we thought of, we shift everything back online. That's what we did uh, earlier this Monday. No, no, not Monday, sorry, January, um, in February, we did, we, we took out our whole marketing effort. We rebuilt it from ground up. <clears throat> we, we set our target and then we started a brand new brand as well. Uh, and the new brand that I built basically is um, DIYwatch.club. And this is where I practically took an Ionic offline shop experience. And then I put it into a package and then I just ship it to everyone. So this is, um, by the way, just disclaimer, right? So I help out big businesses before. I know that there are big businesses taking hit these days. I'm also in the, in the, in the watch and clock AC. So um, when, we, when we do the meeting over here, trying to help out brands, we do know that it's a very difficult time. Um, I have the luxury of having a lifestyle business that's kind of small in scale. So I can basically just take down components and start new things within months. Um, so I'm aware that it's difficult out there. Um, don't want to make this sound overly easy, but for, for, for what, for ourselves, right? We basically pack our offline experience, ship it, ship it to around the world. And because people are stuck at home, they basically took up on it like real quickly. So now our new brand, the sales is catching up to Yonic. And after a while with the marketing revamp, Yonic is also going back a lot more online and then the growth is also quite significant. So this year, starting from around February, I think until now, if both brands combined, we grew over 300%. If it's both brands combined. If it's just Yonic, we went around 150, I would say. So um, it's been, we are cautious to know that this is not going to last forever. So we took on the opportunity. And then now we are immediately shifting our marketing efforts again to plan for the next, not like the next wave, but the next change in the economy. When people can go back on the street, but with the awareness of shopping online, right? A lot of people pick up that habit of shopping online now 
they will likely keep part of it. They might not shift completely away from it. So we're shifting our marketing as well, just knowing that things would change. But yeah, interesting time to be in business. Great, good to know. So, Karine, I know that you be, you run different type of business as well because you I know that um, you know you organize the workshop for corporate and startup training. Can you share with us what you do? And also, um, you mentioned uh, in your workshop that is about design thinking, and this is not a method; it's a style. Maybe can you share with us more about it? Well. Uh... A bit difficult to run a workshop in this short time span, but no, you um, can give us a, a concept, <laughs> maybe for a few minutes. This is the challenge because you only have few minutes. Um, the does so my background. I, I did design thinking in Stanford. Um, in fact, I work for professors like um, Larry Leifer, um, Steve Blank, uh, and then Tom Kosnick. So. It's, it's, it's quite fun to actually see that even within Stanford, different professors have different interpretation of design thinking. So I think that's, if you guys are looking at design thinking, know that even within Stanford, we have different school of thoughts. And once you go into East Coast and West Coast, now we have very different school of thoughts, but they're all very practical. So MIT and Harvard, for example, have a different approach as well. Now, just look at entrepreneurship, we have a, like, Take two extremes, just to show you guys how different they can be. Within the, the uh, Larry Leifer camp, so kind of the ME310, um, exhaustive idea generation camp on, on design thinking, we want to prototype within seven seconds. So prototype, not like making a product, but you can draw out something on a piece of paper with a Sharpie, not a pen because you're gonna have too much detail. Um, use a Sharpie and then you can try to prototype something, draw a screen out and ask people, would you like this or not? Now, there is something called discipline entrepreneurship from MIT, which is also design thinking applied on entrepreneurship, which tells you to do like a, almost like a 10 by 10 or 14 by 14 grid on different persona, different possible market segments. And then you apply to each one of them um, different formulas to figure out whether your product would fit that persona. You can see that this is completely different way of applying design thinking. So now that design thinking it can be can be can change into very different things but we all believe in one thing though is that human are well ambiguous and we are customer centric so we serve human first we don't think too much on the on the numbers but we need to make things viable and be feasible but we want to make things desirable so that's kind of the design thinking background so a little bit along the way that's kind of why i i shifted my business from offline which is not viable, business viable at the same, at, like business viable at that time. It's feasible, it's not viable, to something that's like addressing a pain. You're stuck at home, I don't know what to do in the weekends, um, to creating a pack of DIY watch experience that I can ship straight to your house. So yeah, so that's kind of, you can kind of see that I'm, I'm putting the design thinking into a small company of mine, which I have full control. So. In a, in a bigger environment, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. So I do run workshops where it's like, if you're not just selling a product, sometimes it can be applied as a lifestyle because we individually can be looked at as a product. One of the most powerful homework I've ever done in Stanford is to run all the design thinking and business toolkits with, with me being the product. So I need to do strategic positioning. I need to do that, figure out what my own value, um, value add to the customer which is my boss or potential employee. Um, and then also like on need analysis, like what, what are the needs? <clears throat> what needs am I fulfilling? What desires am I fulfilling? Are there any barriers that's stopping others from talking to me or to work with me or to even be afraid of initiating a conversation with me when I'm the, at the head of my company now? So it's, it's very interesting. So. Design thinking is something I strongly encourage you guys to go look, look up on it, but it's, it's going to be a wide space. Just keep in mind, it's always about customer centric and it's always iterative. With these two mindset in, in, in your head, then you can kind of see why the different frameworks, you always have some sort of loop, like agile, uh, like lean, they always have some sort of loop, but at the end of the day, there is always one piece that's going to be about the customer needs and the behavior. Great. Thank you. Thank you for 
help us to help me at least uh, to understand design thinking in this sort of period of time. So thank you, Karine. Okay, now we will. Uh, I know many of us watch Hong Kong movie before, and Hong Kong movie is one of Hong Kong's signature culture and industry. I'm going to introduce Elvis and Hong Kong film director. Let's watch some of his works before we meet him. <laughs> Um, hi, Elvis. Okay. Okay. Elvis moved from Hong Kong to California in 1991. He graduated from UC San Diego. He gave up his career in Silicon Valley to, to pursue his filmmaking dream in 2002. In 2016, he graduated from Master of Fine Art in Film Directing in Beijing Film Academy. Hello, Elvis. Um, everyone. Hi, thank you for, for yeah, good morning. Good morning. It's evening in San Francisco now here. Yeah, yeah so thank you for uh, being with us today. Yeah, thank you. My honor. So after you moved back to Hong Kong for good in 2002, I, I, you were all the way from all the position like production assistant, assistant director, copywriter, so many, many different uh, position um, to be who you are today. I know this journey is not easy. Can you share uh, with us that what motivates you? Um, I think like many uh, artists in the world, um, there are three words um, to motivate me dream, mission, and legacy. Um, if you don't have a dream, you don't want to uh, get into the mess of movie industry because um, the, tough, the toughness of film industry will torture you to, uh, to, to a stage that you, you will have to give up. And uh, you got to have a mission uh, to accomplish really make a film. But to make a film, uh, you got to start from the bottom. If you all of a sudden you want to, you just tell somebody, I want to be a director, film director, and you got $5 million or uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. And then when you get to the set, the shooting set, you don't know what to do. So you got to fight from the bottom to, to the to the director, film director uh, position. Uh, the first, the first uh, motivation is the legacy. Um, many people, um, they have uh, their family or their sons and daughters are their legacy. Uh, but there are some artists uh, uh, think, have always dreamed of legacies uh, uh, of their own works, uh, artworks, uh, film works. And um, uh, don't even say to dream about uh, getting some grand prizes like uh, Cannes uh, or, or Oscars. But uh, if you could successfully make one film that is uh, 100 or 120 minutes, that satisfaction and a sense of achievement uh, are nothing come to compare. So um, that all these uh, dream, uh, mission and legacy motivate me. 
Thank you. Thank you, Elvis. I know, um, you know, I follow your Facebook for a long time, so I know it's definitely it's not easy. So um, other question, for many decades, Hong Kong was the third large motion picture industry in the world after Indian cinema, American cinema. We can see that the film making hub moved from Hong Kong from Beijing in past decade. How do you see the value and positioning of Hong Kong movie and production industry? Um, I, everyone in the world knows um, the Hong Kong movie industry uh, was the uh, Hollywood in the East or Eastern Hollywood, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s of the last century. Um, but uh, at the end of this golden age, then I get into the film industry. So I, I'm, I'm treating myself very bad. Uh, uh, from 2000 to now, uh, for almost 20 years, um, I experienced the, 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 the most harsh uh, market environment uh, in Hong Kong uh, uh, about the film industry and the box offices. Um, but how come I can, I could still uh, fight to the end, like, like now, until now, I haven't given up. Is that uh, uh, the market uh, still exists, but not in Hong Kong? Um, uh, so what what have Hong Kong filmmakers done uh, during this depression, the e economic depression of the film market? Is uh, I think just like Daniel and Quinn said, um, people and humans are the most important, the most essential factor of the industry is uh, wherever the market is, Hong Kong filmmakers are one of the most toughness fighters in the entire world film industry. Uh, everybody knows a uh, uh, Hong Kong film director, uh, uh, ha, has have gone through has gone through many harshness uh, till they could make a movie, and uh, uh, so if the market moves, then we move. I'm one of the very um, um, uh, examples uh, who have who has moved to uh, Beijing. Uh, by at in the year of two thousand and thirteen, um, I had no hope uh, anymore to uh, uh, make a to get a budget to make a movie in Hong Kong. So uh, my last bet in my life uh, towards this dream, this dream, make filmmaking dream, is to um, try a Beijing Film Academy. And uh, besides studying, uh, the most important agenda is to get to know more filmmakers and, and all the investors uh, uh, in the Beijing film industry. So everyone goes to Beijing, everyone goes to China. But uh, what, what, what's the legacy of film, Hong Kong filmmakers uh, still are worth? Um, up until now, 2020, you have heard many good movies, many good chi uh, chi chi Chinese mainland movies uh, are still directed by Hong Kong film directors. Um, and for in my case, uh, I just made a, a movie uh, last year uh, before pandemic and um, uh, it's a feature film. Uh, my first, so it's weird that um, after 20, 18 years of struggle, a Hong Kong film director's first film is, is a China, uh, China mainland film, but uh, I think uh, we are all Chinese. So uh, I think that doesn't make a very big cultural difference, but, uh, but the, the market uh, make us difference. Uh, or you say Hong Kong market or China market, but right now uh, in, 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 this, in, in the common sense of today's Hong Kong filmmakers, uh, there's no China, uh, mainland market, Taiwan market, or Hong Kong market. It's greater China market. So we just got to struggle uh, and, and, and try out any 
opportunities in China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Okay, good. Thank you, Elvis. And what type of movie would you like to produce and why? Uh, uh, people might have heard uh, there are many uh, Chinese movies that are uh, uh, about uh, uh, talking about our, our countries, uh, uh, China mainland, uh, like uh, military or some uh, social issues. Um, to me, um, I really want to make a movie uh, saying um, about the uh, social concerns uh, between uh, all the Chinese people. Um, I love Taiwan mainland, Taiwanese mainlanders, Hong Konger, Hong Kongese, or we are all one, uh, one, uh, what should I say, um, uh, type of, uh, well, we are all yellow skin, we are all uh, from the same Chinese Asian culture. Uh, I want to uh, spread the harmony, uh, um, uh, love, faith, hope, uh, uh, to all some social, concern, social concerns in the Chinese community, in the China market. Thank you. I see the big difference. I still remember like a long time ago, you saying that you want to have something great or all of the movie in the war. Now it's changing. It's more telling like what is really happening in the society. And I remember you recently you now talking that you want to feature the minority in Hong Kong and talking about the story. So thank you, Elvis. Now, Thank you, thank you, Elvis. Now we're going to open up for the Q and A. So um, uh, it will be it will be great that you can submit the question in the chat room or the Q and A session. So probably I will wait one minute. I will go back to check the question. So. Um, uh, um, you know, I want to say that is uh, thank you for all the panelists for what an insightful sharing today. So for the audience, if you would like to learn more about our panelist work and want to connect with them, um, in the later of this uh, uh, webinar, you can follow the um, uh, social media and also the website and you can find out the contact information. So, okay, I have the first question from from Johnny, this is the question for Queen. Queen, so um, so this question for you. So sure. uh, from Johnny, the Rosa, uh, interesting business model. What do you target audience? How big a group like the DIY watch, and how do you sustain the loyalty? Oh, okay. Now, uh, okay, DIY watch can be understood as two different things. Um, sometimes design your own also becomes DIY. So um, on Ionic side of things, um, it's more like, it's actually kind of a niche market. It's not so niche as in people don't want a custom watch. It's niche that most people don't have the patience to design their own watch. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a different kind of niche. So once I get that customer base, um, on, it's, it's actually quite technical. You can actually do remarketing. So it's something on Facebook and Instagram where you can just find your existing customer or people who have been your website and then re-engage them with different kind of ads. So we do that extensively. So, <clears throat> so over time, um, people will learn about different aspects of us. Sometimes even um, after you bought, let's say you bought one watch from us, after 60 or 90 days, you'll start getting a little bit of a, let's say an event update or maybe like some of the new things that we launch. So then we can keep people engaged. But for Ionic, it's a lot of one-time purchase. Um, so demographic, young adults, 25, 35, 
we started to have some 40 something um, and then 50 something as well in our store, physical store, but online is still younger. Um, DIY Watch Club, we have a broad range from like 16 to 30 something to 40 something. We're still looking for it. We started the brand in February, so it's pretty new. Now, DIY Watch is a lot easier to retain my customer. I just give them an upgrade component, then they come back. <laughs> yeah. So they come back and then they buy a new case. So all of a sudden, you, you spend like maybe 40 bucks, even cheaper, I can't remember. And then you can change your watch into a different color. So that that actually gives them the hobby of tinkering, right? So it's kind of like putting things together and then hacking it, modding it. So that 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 automatically by default was a more recurrent model, I'd say. Oh, thank you, Queen. Thank you, Queen. Uh, now I have the next question is um, uh, for um, Elvis. So, um, um, Korean Korean cinema or pop music has taken off in the U.S. Now you really can see that it's really popular in the U.S. now for the teenagers singing the Korean songs. How can Hong Kong film and pop do that too? How could uh, Hong Kong film or uh, pop music do that too to have the, the big influence? Uh, first of all, Hong Kong's pop music uh, uh, already had a, a huge influence uh, in the 80s and 90s of the last century. Um, but for film, uh, I think uh, Hong Kong film uh, uh, in, uh, makers and industry have not died uh, uh, eventually. Eventually, we are moving to uh, through China, through the gates, gates of China mainland to the world. Um, um, like uh, uh, there was a movie. There was a movie just uh, 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 shown in China than in U.S. It's about the eight hundred uh, uh, soldiers uh, defending Shanghai uh, in the in Second World War, and uh, and there are some Hong Kong filmmakers in that movie. Uh, so, uh, I think, I think about Korean, uh, like the movies can, could get a, a Os an Oscar of best picture. Um, actually, uh, uh, to, to the Chinese, uh, uh Taiwan mainland and, and Hong Kong in uh, as, as a whole, we have already made such an achievement, but, uh, I think what, what, what the question really is, uh, behind the, the, the person who asked this question is uh, could Hong Kong film or music uh, resurrect? I think that's the question. And it really depends on the makers, uh, uh, how they perceive the market, uh, uh, how to strike. Um, just like Japan, right? Um, Japanese uh, movies and, uh, and, and songs were very hit in the 70s and early 80s. But if they, they could not continue uh, in the late 90s and 2000s because they were replaced by Hong Kong, the hype. And, uh, and, but the but, uh, Japanese movie, there was a one Japanese movie got the grand prize of uh, a Golden Palm in Cannes, uh, France, uh, like years ago. Um, so, so uh, to Hong Kong people, uh, we, we are following something like the trend of the Japanese uh, entertainment industry. But uh, 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 as long as we, we don't die, there will be a, a movie or some song that will, will, will got some good hits in, in the world. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I believe so too. So I am supportive for Hong Kong culture. So thank you, Elvis. Thank you. So my next question is for Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Oh, okay. Now you can you you can unmute yourself. I'm going to ask your question. So um, I know Kunjun has a long history, and uh, I see uh, um, you know recently you guys try to promote to the young generation of Kunjun because in the Hong Kong market, because I know that um, you 80 of yourselves is export. So for the Hong Kong market, you try to promote to the younger generation. How, how do you do that now? So what is your strategy? Um, so right now, because, um, well, usually when, when there's no pandemic, um, 
I'm um, usually half the time I'm in the in Canada or the U.S. Uh, booking my customers, but you know because of the pandemic, uh, I've been stuck in Hong Kong for for ten months already. So um, we'll be kind of reallocate our marketing resources to the local market, and that's the only market that we can you know like have, get have a direct reach to to them. So um, we've been using um, social media more often than we were doing you know compared to, to 2019, 2018. So um, um, some of our strategies on uh, social media will be um, because, you know, as you know, social media, when we're talking about Facebook or Instagram, these are, uh, 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 you know, like, uh, 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 I guess, like social media for, is for the young, younger generation. I mean, older ladies, you know, like they, they also use Facebook, but not as much as the younger generations. Um, some of the strategies we've been doing is that uh, with, uh, as I uh, studied history, you know, before, so I dig up some of, I, I work with the University of Hong Kong with some of our professors. Um, they were some of my friends and colleagues back at, at school. And uh, we dig up some of the history historical re, uh, resources that we, we can find in the libraries. And we use those to, you know, like to reach out to, to kind of do a retro feel to it. Um, if you go to our Facebook uh, pages, you can see um, the advertisement from the 1950s. So we are doing these kind of like retro feel to our, like how in, in cooperation to the Bay in Hong Kong, you know, like that, um, uh, uh, um, you know, like kind of rebranding kind of feel to it. And also, we are also doing some kind of recipes. Um, we've been doing for several years already. And I guess we'll do more uh, for the local market, targeting the local market. And hopefully by, by early, by Monday or Tuesday, we'll post a Thanksgiving uh, a recipe as well. Um, maybe a gravy, <laughs> probably not, not turkey, because I, I, I don't think I, we, I can find a turkey uh, in Hong Kong to, to, and, and have a such a huge oven to, to grill the turkey. So uh, we might post a, 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 a gravy recipe using our soy sauce, uh, kind of like an Asian meal to gravy um, on Monday or Sunday. So that's kind of like what's coming up. Coming up. Um, and we also want to work with, you know, like different um, festivals and, you know, like a celebration. We have different kind of recipes to it. Um, during summer, we worked with, um, you know, um, just past, uh, not summer, Halloween. Uh, we post a, a recipe using pumpkins and using local, you know, like uh, pork and, and make a dish out of it. So um, these are little things that we'll be doing. And at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our showroom might get more made in Hong Kong products. You know, it, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be food related. Uh, it can be watches, you know, like, um, and other things as well. And also, you know, like these are kind of the online and offline you know, you know, different ways that we can reach out to the locals. Yeah, so now I see that you can connect with, with Quint right away uh, after this webinar now. So great. And okay, and last question is also for Daniel. So uh, we have uh, one, uh, 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 we have a Johnny De Rosa asked this question. I think this is a great question. He said, when he shop for the sauces, I always debating is buying Kunjan and other brand can, um, because he want to support Hong Kong product. Can can you give us uh, some reason why we buy Kunjan? I can I can say it for you, but I save it for let you to to do that. Okay, um, so we are one hundred percent made in Hong Kong. Um, our soybeans are from Canada. You'll be surprised that, you know, like we get soybeans all the way from Canada and come to Hong Kong. And then we, we spend at least six months to do the brewing. And then afterwards we send it back to Canada and back to the States, you know, like a, kind of like this trade, you know, like we, we support global trade, you know, like in, in, in certain way. And um, for the other brands that she mentioned, um, um, that is a Hong Kong brand, but their factory is not located in Hong Kong. It's located in mainland China. 
So um, people have been asking me um, questions that, oh, are you guys going to move to mainland China to the Greater Bay Area? Sorry, Mr. Chow. You know, like uh, uh, people have been asking me, uh, even my my dad or even my grandparents. You know, like um, Hong Kong, that the, the labor expense, that the land is very expensive. All the all the materials are very expensive. Are you guys going to move to somewhere else? Um, but you know, because I need to respect my great grandfather, my grandfather's um, view that we will still maintain in Hong Kong. We won't move it somewhere to you know to Guangdong or, or Guangzhou uh, because of our connection to Hong Kong. And also, uh, we might plan to have a secondary factory somewhere else, um, maybe in the U.S. Uh, we haven't decided that yet. Uh, somewhere in the U.S. Uh, Probably not in California because it's too expensive and also the, uh, there's an earthquake, but maybe in Nevada or maybe in Georgia, you know, like I, I see some of the uh, attendees there from, from Georgia and Nevada. Uh, maybe we can, we'll, we'll set up a, a secondary factory in the future, not the near future, because we still need to get a lot of things done before a, a factory is being, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, built. So um, these are some of the future plans and, you know, like um, we will still maintain in Hong Kong to, and to return to the questions, uh, we use um, uh, Canadian soybeans, we use uh, Australian so uh, sea salt and uh, of course local water and then to, to produce our, so our sauces. And also for our, our sugar, if I remember correctly, they are all from um, South Korea. So it's a, it's, Really, you know, like connected to Hong Kong as a, as a whole, it's an international business. Uh, we get re uh, resources from other parts of the world, and we maintain this kind of uh, Hong Kong heritage and export overseas. So here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank we thank don't you encourage you to move your factory to the Greater Bay Area. We just want you to promote your business to the Greater Bay Area. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me introduce our last speaker, Wilson Lau, Chairman of a Hong Kong Association of Northern California. Say a few words to conclude tonight's event. Welcome, Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. I would like to thank you, um, all the wonderful um, people who spoke today, and all of you taking time out of your busy personal and professional schedule to attend this call. The mission of Hong Kong Association is devoted to fostering closer economic cultural and academic ties between Hong Kong and North America, and to facilitate business opportunity for individuals and corporations. Please check out the local chapter in your area. In 2021, Hong Kong Association will have more programs, networking events through virtual sitting. We would like to take our event to promote your business and expand more business opportunities. Please sign up as members and follow us in the social media. Let me again, and at this closing instance, Thank you all for having um, joined this 10th webinar and we are looking to, uh, forward to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you, Bosen. So here is our um, uh, panelists' um, uh, social media information. You can feel free to uh, take a picture of that and also you can find that in all the social media. Um, and also, um, after this webinar, you will receive a short uh, surveys. It will be great that you can answer them, answer them and then send it back to us. It will be great that we can, how we can improve on our next webinar. If you want to um, us to do other webinar in certain uh, industry, please give us the idea and then Yeni and I will work on them. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, and happy to see you virtually here.